Tarovalava, I'm Monty Beetham, and thank you for choosing Once a Warrior. Now, I've been told I've got a huge bias towards the Fords. So, for the first time this season on Once a Warrior, we have our very first back, although he would be at home in the Fords. That is Clinton Torp. He came to the club in 1999. He debuted then, and he played his last game in 2006. Clinton Torpy, how are you, my man? Yeah, good. Thanks, Mons. Uh, been a while reminiscing some of those chats we've had. Um, yeah, no, thanks for having me on. I really, uh, really appreciate Sky Sport getting us going. Great to have you on, man. Now, you're over on the Gold Coast, but what are you up to now? Yeah, so I've uh, been fortunate enough to work in community since finishing in 2011. So good 10, 11 years. I started working with Preston Campbell when we finished up doing some community work through the Titans for Tomorrow, a community organisation of the, the Titans. And from there, I was given an opportunity to uh, work within the NRL. And they have a community arm, which is delivering some marquee programs, you know, around social issues that are impacting our community. So been a part of the State of Mind team since, uh, full time since 2018. And uh, I'm still here, so must be doing all right. Well, they run out of people to hire. No, you're a good man. I've seen you do your thing, brother. You talk with passion, and um, I, I think everyone resonates with you. Now, the first time I saw you was uh, playing for Auckland South. I was playing hooker, and you were in the forward pack at the time. And I went there, left that game, saw my boys that night having a few beers, as you do, and I said, I found the next Gordon Tellis, although this guy has got feet. You debuted in the back row, man, against South in April of 1999. Uh, and I, I, I'm pretty sure you had shoulder pads too, man. How did you get the call up and uh, <laughs> what did you remember from that debut? Oh, uh, you know, rewinding it back the year before, um, Henry Fafili, Henry Perinara, Shantae Hape, and myself and uh, one other brother got given a scholarship for the Warriors. And we were 18 at the time and... I got the tap on the shoulder when I was playing for the Odahu Leopards. I seen Mark Graham roll up, and I think he came up to me before the warm-up and just sort of said, mate, well, I'm here to watch you. Uh, we're thinking of bringing you into the Warriors, so, you know, give you a crack. I was just over the moon. I was chuffed, and I think, you know, that preparation that, that week was just unreal. Like, I know it's thrown out a lot. Um, you know, it's a dream come true, but it, it really was, you know, from having... Pictures of the boys on my wall to to run alongside them was something that I'll, I'll always remember. And it's, you know, stories I share with kids when I go out into the community about my way of, um, you know, being a visual goal setter. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know it at the time, but it's just the way that I try to impart some some knowledge onto the young ones. Toops, uh, like we said, centre was somewhere where we found you. You found your, your, your place where you felt at home, but fullback. Uh, talk to me about fullback and how that one came about, man, because Gordon Tallis would not look at home at fullback. <laughs> yeah, look, I think I was ringing wet maybe 80-something kilos when I came to the Warriors, and I think uh, I think it was a training run, and because I was sort of second, third string mm. brought into the, you know, the squad, they were putting players into position, and they, they had no fullback for the reserves. And Mark Graham sort of said to me, he goes, mate, we'll put you at fullback. And then he chuckled and had a bit of a laugh, but he goes, but it'll never happen. Um, but, you know, he sure was eating his words a couple of weeks later because I went well against the, the A grade or the, you know, the Warriors team at the time. And I think I stood out for him and, you know, gave him that question mark, like, oh, maybe he could. Uh, fast forward a couple of weeks, boys are playing kick tennis, which was a fun game. We all like playing, uh, as you do as professional players in in the gym. And that's when I think uh, one of the boys got injured, or I, I know who it was. It was Matthew Ridge, but the I think boy. it came out differently in the media. The opportunity started presenting itself from there, but definitely the, um, I guess, value add I was able to contribute to the team was in, in the centres. Yeah, that's over two decades ago when we started our career at the club, uh, 1999. So um, let's not strain our brain too much. Let's go back now and look at some of the footage of a young Clinton Torpy doing his thing in the jumper. Torpy, options inside, options outside. Don't worry, boys, I'll go myself. Clinton Torpy, he'll go and score. Clinton Torpy's over. This is Torpy. 
Corby. Beautiful hands. Corby, he got a pass. Oh! Torby unloading again. Torby, Torby's got power. He'll get the try. The chance the Warriors. Torby, Torby will make it. Oh, look at Torby go. He's got too much pace. Look at him go. And doesn't he love it? Toops, when you, when you watch that, man, how, how, how does that make you feel? What's the sort of first memories that come to mind? Yeah, just that, um, I don't know, just that uh, culture we had there, that vibe we had there. It was, um, we were just playing how we would play in our backyard, you know, with our uncles growing up, you know. I just remember playing hit-ups with my uncles, but when we, it conditioned me, really, uh, when you think about it, and every other kid that played footy in those that, those days, it conditioned us once we got in and started playing at the Warriors. We were able to nurture that. And, you know, that, that comes down to a good man, as you know. Daniel Anderson, one of the best coaches, if not the best coach I've ever been under, um, you know, promoting and showcasing the skill that every New Zealander is renowned for. And I was just glad that we had a group of guys that believed in it and had faith in it and, you know, backed ourselves when we, we were given those opportunities. And when you first came to the club, some would say you got a chip on your shoulder or it's just you being the authentic you doing what you do. You mentioned, Reggie, um, and, and what happened early on in terms of making a cup of tea or not making a cup of tea? <laughs> yeah, so I did come in with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I wasn't, I, I'm not too sure if I was disrespectful, but I just felt like um, there was a bit of hierarchy there and I never took to hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. I was just being me and maybe that looked like an arrogant little but um, <laughs> I remember the senior boys, which was Reggie, Joe Vagana, I think it might have been Taps, Tony Tumababi and all those guys were playing cards and they yelled out, Toops, make us a cup of tea. Could have been Joe and um, Swanee, who's from East Side Till I Die, so, you know, brothers, we all from Alp Pamir, GI ways, and he sort of said, don't tell him go and get effed, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, nah, get effed, go make it yourself. And can you imagine a little 17-year-old, 18-year-old telling, you know, these guys that are you know, established players, represented our country, getting told to get effed by a little junior, but... Um, I I was going off the back of what Logue said. I was look I looked up to Logue. He was on my wall, as as were many of the other players. But um, yeah, it didn't end too well. Those boys managed to get me back. I didn't have my uh, training gear for the whole uh, three days that we were away, uh, and I got in trouble every time. And, yeah. Some know, down trials, there was everything there, mate. But um, you know that's 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 one part of you that I like the fact that you would just live or die by the sword. Uh, the other thing with you is your competitive nature, man. You were so fiercely competitive. You were always competing. Like, where did that come from? Because put that in, in touch with your aggression too. Those two were side by side for you, some of your biggest traits. Yeah, look, um, I'll put it down to me. My brother my, my brother and I, we used to go down and play down um, in Pamua called Dunkirk, which is down the road. And we used to play footy down there in that rainy days and things like that. And he used to toughen me up, beat me up. But also when I played with my uncles, um, my my uncle was, you know, an up-and-coming uh, footballer, but, you know, things took took a turn and didn't end up reaching the heights that he wanted to. So I wanted to try and represent my Baker Fano, my Baker family that were um, very much talented family. We would always compete. I always wanted to play in their touch team, but, because uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was. Maybe I had butterfingers then like I did when I started playing because I was so determined to run a hole or run hard as I can that I forgot to keep my hands up ready for the ball. And there's some stories in that, as you can probably remember, what Daniel did to myself and Justin Murphy. But I think I put a lot of that competitive nature down to... Oh, you can't bring it up and uh, not brother, use it, mate. You family. can't bring it up and not use it. Now, I it just refresh <laughs> my memory in terms of uh, you had to catch the ball early, you had to have your hands in this position, but you didn't. So what happened with Clinton Torpy? Bit of old uh, duct tape, was it? <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know, there was these rehab... Um, uh, I don't know if you call them devices or things like that, that... It had like a like I think it was around your waist, and it had these extension pieces that 
um, were for your legs and things like that. For some reason, um, they managed to put that around myself and um, Justin Murphy because we had butterfingers. And it got to me psychologically, but um, he taped, like these things, extensions went out to about here, made our hands up, and then they taped us around here. It was a bit of a laugh for the boys, but it uh, it did rock me, you know, because I knew um, at the time I'd started getting a reputation. But, oh, he's always dropping it. And it, I know I was letting not just my teammates down, I was letting the supporters, my family, and it was starting to get to me psychologically. And I'd always want to have blue on my hands and things like that, but I'm glad I, I overcome it in the end. But um, because I was so determined to run lines that all, all everything else was out of my mind, I just wanted to run that line hard as I mm. could or try and, you know, be there in the moment, but forgetting to run with my hands up, which is a skill that we were... I hadn't developed. <laughs> That's what I loved about you, but, brother. You, know. you were always all in. Everything you did, you do it so hard. You spoke about that line. You spoke about attack. I mean, that mentality, as a hooker, me being in that position, I look for Stacey Jones, but there'd also be what they call a hot call. If you hear the call <laughs> hot, and it doesn't come out often because it is one that overrides any call. Stacey calls the ball, but if you hear a hot, it's on. The only problem is Stacey would want the ball, and this guy would be calling hot, hot. First tackle, second tackle, third tackle, hot, oh. hot. And at the top yeah. of your voice every time, Clinton Torpy, what was it about you and, and always wanting to attack? Because, I mean, you know, that's hard to contend with, you know? Yeah, it, yeah. I think I wore it out at the end. I remember Daniel and you know, everybody saying, mate, calm the F down with your hot calls. Because, you know, for me, as soon as I saw an opportunity or weakness, I just wanted to exploit it. And I think... That's that kind of camaraderie, that kind of confidence we had in each other and our abilities because we, we did it at trainings. We were allowed to do it in the game day. So uh, I think that's where a lot of it came from. Just just the, I think, belief in, in my ability, but also those around me. You know, I think um, that was one of the, the strong points of our, our culture was that belief in each other. I think we had a song. And I think it was by Lappi Marina as a matter of faith. And I think that was, you know, that was us to a T. Mm. Daniel Anderson, you mentioned his name a couple of times. You've really said he's the best coach you've been under. Let's talk about Ando. Uh, what did you en enjoy the most? And, you know, because, I mean, what made you go from being the boy from Otahahu, who was at Mount Wellington Warriors, who became the best centre in the world bar none in 2002? I just think the... The conditioning games, the, the actually giving me a bit of free reign or the team free reign to exploit skills that we developed as juniors, you know, whether that's at our junior clubs, whether that was with our family, he didn't take that away from us. He actually made us fine tune it. So he was developing games, fun con games that would allow us to be sharper in terms of offloading. So as you know, we would have an offloading drill. If we were poor at support, we'd do a support drill. Um, the way we grip the ball, I used to grip the ball. I know I probably don't have a thing here, but I used to hold the ball like this and run around and offload. When I offloaded, it was only going one way and that was out of my hands. But he changed it to grab the ball. You know, he would it, it'd use Ali as the example. Grab your, those, use those bloody big mitts of yours like Ali's makes it look like an avocado, but you grip it and then bring it into your chest that kind of stuff, you know. I think he allowed us to develop and sharpen that stuff without taking too much of that that natural ability away from us. He just gave us so much confidence in ourselves that when we got the opportunity to do it, it was second nature. So people looked out there and they go, oh, they're just throwing it off a cuff, but it's it was ingrained, you know. It was trained. It wasn't like by accident. Yes, we did it when we were younger, but... We also sharpened it up at trainings as well, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to that left edge, probably one of the most potent in uh, in our history, and I say that with a bit of a bias, but yourself, um, Ali Lautiti, <laughs> Francis Malley, and you've got so much talent on one edge. I mean, Stacey used to shift that ball nice and early at times just to get it to you, just to get it to um, uh, Ali Lautiti. How do you talk and how do you know who's going to get what ball at what time because if you're calling hot every set every tackle of the set <laughs> and then Ali's out there and you've got the likes of um, Franny and, and so on who gets the ball how do you run how do you decide what's the comms like uh, amongst them all yeah look one of the great things about 
um, Stace, and I'm so glad that he was able to get it down into the Hall of Fame. So, could, you know, big ups to Stace. But he was a kind of player, and I I tell it time and time again, that he was a selfless player. Mm. He was a player who, who didn't like the limelight or even though the limelight was always on him, he was a kind of player when he ran to the line. And if you can think about every option that is on when the half goes to the line, there's probably six, seven options. So six, seven players are running full tilt as as hard as they can, knowing that Stace is going to pick the right ball nine times out of ten. And that was the difference with Stacey and any other half that I'd played with, is that he put it on the money every single time, whether that was a cross kick, whether that was a grubber, whether that was a short ball, long ball, inside ball, around the back. Everything was just quality and class from from Stace. And again, one of the best I've ever played outside of and you know, value still to this day. In terms of the player they are and the strength that they brought to that edge, um, Ali Laotiti. I don't think I've ever seen another person you know, in in the era of my time and, and maybe 10 years on either side that I can remember that has come close to being that. Ali wasn't the fittest. Ali wasn't the strongest. Um, but Ali come to the field and, yeah, would just make everybody look like kiddies. The, 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 his skill set, his ability, you know, Ali was just one of those gifted players that you've never been able to remodel or find mm. at all you know just what he did with the ball what he did with a team the confidence you would get and and, and that's what i got to put a lot of what i got in terms of success i got to put that down to guys like ali guys like stacy jones all these guys were high caliber and and made my job a lot easier so can you imagine an opposition doing their video like oh make sure we get numbers around him so as soon as they got numbers around him, that's three or four that he's drawing in, which is making space for myself or whoever was outside um, Ali or inside Ali. So it just made my job a whole lot easier. I go back to some of the, uh, the hair products before game and some of the colouring <laughs> of boots. And I think, what happened? Yeah, look, I just think we were just kids playing in an adult's game. And I think we just enjoyed the moment we were being ourselves and although it might have stirred a few of the senior players at the time like camp on them often that we were doing the pre-game speech in the in the change rooms you guys would be off you hear that and you'd be painting your boots you'd be painting your boots or you'd be doing your hair you know i had a little bit of hair back then but not as much as yourselves uh until after one game and uh your coach that you love so much said yes. what yeah, yeah. I think it was St. George and before the game, I think it was myself, Shawnee and Henry Fafili. We were, yeah, we were doing our hair. But the funny thing was, it was no different from any other game. And I was, my, my saying was, look good, feel good, play good. It's all good, you know. Yeah. And um, that particular game, maybe I had a bit too much wax still stuck on my head. So we'd, we went down, we got absolutely hammered by St. George, but um, we were just finding a reason and that was us doing our hair. Uh, I think, and, and reverting back to the colouring in our boots, Fafili again and myself, we we got mocked. We got mocked for colouring our boots silver because, you know, we used to sign silver on our black jerseys. We had gold and things like that. And, and we were like, man, what happens if our boots were silver or gold? So we started yeah. colouring them in. People laughed at us, but, you know, within a year or two, Puma were de making those type boots. So whether we were transcenders, whether we were pioneers, you know, like I said, that was our character. We were boys playing a man's game, and sometimes we were doing boy things before mm. games, which was, you know, doing our hair or colouring and boots. What was the most memorable games for Clinton Torpy? Because um, your highlight package uh, showed that you did a lot of wonderful things in terms of X Factor. Uh, I think the home semi uh, versus Canberra, having that massive crowd, getting that win as well was a good way to reward the support that had been there for so long. And 
people didn't want to come and play us at our home game. People feared us. People, you know, didn't, didn't go, oh, if you hang in there with them, um, you know, you'll, you'll roll them in the second half. I had a post on the weekend was of the 2002 team and it just went off and we had people from Willie Mason commenting on it, all sorts of people, uh, fans and, and so on on it. But you had an emoji of a tear beside your eye. Um, talk to me about that, man. Yeah, man, like 20 years on, it still hurts. And and that was one of my other memorable games, mate. As much as we lost that grand final, I still... Like, I won a grand final over in um, England with Leeds, but the loss in that game we played still hurts, even though it was one that it's a memorable one. Like, we, we got there on merit of our hard work, our belief, our supporters, our family and friends. It, it, was, it was a time when, you know, league was at a good place. Mm. Those were some moments that will... We'll, live on but the pain still is there as well it's as raw as watching you know the 2002 grand final winners roosters walking out onto the field you know the game that they played our boys mm. and, um yeah like i said that that that's real tears man that still hurts no, no, so, you know you, you don't forget those once a warrior always a warrior you're one of the most fierce warriors i had the pleasure of playing alongside so thank you for your time in the jumper and your time on the show today man uh, you're very welcome, once. Thanks to Sky Sport. And obviously, your handsome self will give me the opportunity to come on. I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing more of the boys come on and, and, and express and share all their, their memories. It's been awesome. Thank you. My man, there you go. Clinton Torpy, 2002 Grand Final. And next week on the show, Once a Warrior, we've got Louis Brown, who was part of the 2011 Dream Team that almost got there in the Grand Final. See you there, same time, same place. Straight through goes Torpy. Here comes a try for Torpy. Torpy's away. He's got support. Now here's Torpy. See how he stretches out. He throws the dummy. Webb with the kick. Early in the tackle count. And Torpy! He grabs a double. And it could well be the match winner. And away goes Torpy. He'll score. Shut the gate.